Hello, my name is Gary Howell. I'm the founder of Morgan Walsh Consultancy. We provide IT services to local government and also commercial companies. We're going to take a look at the Iron Building's LoRaWAN People Counter and specifically how to add it to the Things Network version 3 and also physically set up the hardware. The system consists of two boxes and the transmitter sends out a beam of light from here and it's received on the receiver in two places here and here. This allows us to determine whether someone has gone in or out of a building. So using my little friend here, if we go through between the sensors, he will break the beam here and here, so we can record him going into the building, and when he comes out, he breaks the beams here and here, and so we know he's now exited. We need to add these units now to the Things Network version 3. So we go to our Applications console. I've already set up the application called Footfall Monitoring. So therefore we go to End Devices, Add End Device. Now manually, it's an over-the-air activation, and this device supports LoRa version 101. Click Start. On the registration screen, we uh, type in our End Device ID copy and paste our app EUI, our dev EUI, and type in a suitable end device name. Now we go to network layer settings where we select our frequency plan, for us it's Europe, and do not tick class B or C as this is a class A device. On the join settings screen we copy and paste in our app key, then send add end device and on the live data tab we can see the device has been created. To set up the hardware we need both units, four batteries to each, these are just standard AA 1.5 volts not the lithium variety and a magnet or two. To identify the transmitter, on the back of the unit we can just see a product code and that is the transmitter. And when we open the lid you'll see the board is quite simple. So adding the batteries, observing the correct polarity, we then click and release the activate button and the red light in the middle briefly flash twice. We can now replace the cover, ensuring the uh, holes along the bottom match the holes along the bottom of the case. On the receiver side we can identify this by a device EUI printed on the back and a QR code and also note counter A and B markings on the back which we'll come back to later. When we open up the unit we'll see it's more complex inside is the NFC antenna underneath that the read switch which is used during the configuration with the magnet. Add the batteries, again observing the correct polarity. And then replace the cover, again ensuring that the uh, holes still on the bottom match the holes in the bottom of the case. Now the battery has been added, it's the LoRaWAN radio now it sends out a join request as we can see here in the console, and then a payload of initial data. We're now going to look at the configuration options using the Android app and NFC. We must first identify the receiving unit, and as you may recall, this is identified by the uh, dev EUI label on the back. You'll also need your Android phone. I've already installed the app. NFC can be a bit tricky, and I found with this device it's easier to do the initial configuration with the main batteries removed from the unit. NFC is a passive uh, technology and doesn't require power at this stage. The NFC antenna is here, and it communicates with the phone. Starting the app up, we get a ready to scan screen and the NFC antenna on the phone must now uh, go near to the NFC antenna on the device. The phone vibrates 
and the settings are shown on the screen. We won't change many of these, but I will talk you through them. So at the top we have uh, confirm messages, this should be off. The ADR, which is the adaptive data rate, should be on. The reset button should be left off. And we should have OTAA selected over the air activation. The app EUI and app key are set within the device and shouldn't be changed. And the data rates of DR1, min and DR5 max are suitable. And note the LoRaWAN port, LoRaWAN port 1. The interval is set to 15 minutes in this case. And what this means is that every 15 minutes the device will send out a count that it's accumulated over time. Opening up the event settings uh, tab, we can see settings here to enable event reporting. And what this means is that every time the counter, in this case 4, uh, is exceeded, the device will send out the current count to the LoRaWAN gateway. And we'll be demonstrating this a little later. Payload settings, these should be left alone. It's types 2 and variant 6 for this device. Heartbeat settings uh, can be set as you need. Uh, the port number is port 2. The uh, payload and variant are remain 2 and 6. And the heartbeat is currently set to 15 minutes. So this means that every 15 minutes, regardless of what happens on the counting side, the device will send out a count. For this demonstration, we're going to change the event settings to be enabled and set the number of events to 50. What this will mean is that every time the counter counts 50 events, it will send uh, the accumulated count to the LoRaWAN network. So we enter the value required here. And then scroll down to the bottom of the screen and click Save to Center to Center. We now move the uh, NFC uh, aerials together. The phone vibrates, and then we'll go back to the ready to scan screen on the app. We now touch the NFC sensor again, and reread the readings into the phone. And we can confirm if we open up the event settings that our reading was indeed saved, and has been pulled back onto the phone. I'm not going to turn this off as we don't currently require the event settings and set the interval uh, to be reported to 10 minutes. Click Save Settings, approach the NFC antennas, phone vibrates, and back to ready to scan. And finally, as a double check, read this readings back into the phone. And we'll see that the interval is indeed set to 10 minutes. Adding the batteries back into the unit, uh, the unit will attempt to join the LoRaWAN network. And there we have the join request. A blue light flashed on the device. And we'll also see some initial data come through from the device. And you can now replace the cover. Note there's a couple of lugs on the top which need to be in place. Moving on now to the physical setup, you require both units. A tape measure, possibly some double sided tape, a pencil, and a magnet or two. On the back, we'll see a couple of mounting plates. If we just lift the base of the unit and slide the plate out, we'll see there are a couple of countersink holes which can be screwed to the wall. Alternatively, we can use some double-sided tape on the back. Regarding the double-sided tape, I would suggest using a foam-based double-sided tape. Uh, this is, uh, provides uh, resistance to vibration and is less likely to be knocked off if the device gets uh, touched. Uh, this can be purchased from Amazon uh, and is often used in uh, model aircraft building uh, for this vibration reason.
We now need to set the devices on the wall at a suitable height. Here's my little friend here. Uh, a typical uh, height should be about three and a half, four feet uh, above the ground level, which is just above uh, waist height. So using your tape measure, measure this on the wall, uh, mark it with a pencil, and then uh, mount your device on the wall and slide in to the bracket. It's really important to ensure that the uh, counter A is pointing in towards the building. This is this marking here. And as you can see, I've actually marked on the top to help the installers. In terms of uh, the width of the devices, uh, normally this uh, ideal situation is in a corridor uh, and not too wide. So we have uh, two people going through. They're essentially going through in single file, and that's counted as two people in. However, if the sensors are spaced quite far apart, it is possible for people to walk side by side. And even though two people have gone in, that will just be registered as one person. And this may not be what you require. Now, ideally, a unit should be placed on a wall either side, say a corridor. But if not, you may need to mount one of the, or both units onto a pole. Uh, and then adjust the angle so that the uh, beam of light between the two is straight on. The system has an alignment mechanism. This is activated using a magnet placed here in the top right hand corner on the uh, receiving device. If you have a strong magnet like this one here, you can do this through the plastic case. Uh, but if not, and you only have a small magnet, then you will almost certainly need to take the case cover off and then touch your small magnets quite close to the reed switch inside. I have a large magnet here, so I'm going to put the case back on and then move the magnet just over that top right hand corner. You'll see the red light comes on and starts flashing. This is now in alignment mode. It's a bit tricky to show on video, but I'm going to show you uh, the unit slightly angled so you can see the light. So taking the transmitter, we need to align it up so that the uh, beam of light is pointed directly towards the receiver. And what we're looking for is a steady green light. So there we have a steady green light, and you'll notice though that if I then turn the transmitter to the left, and also to the right, the green light goes away and is replaced by a flashing red light. And this means it's out of alignment. So just turn it back to the center until we've got a steady green light and the alignment is done. After a short while the uh, red light will go out and then you won't see any further lights on the device at all to save power. And the units are now in place uh, across a corridor or doorway and will start transmitting its counting to the LoRaWAN network. We hope you found this useful. If there's anything we can do, please do get in touch. Thanks very much for watching.